Thank you very much, and thank you for having me here. It's my first time to Poland and to Warsaw. And uh, I'm here to represent the views of the Scientific Council of the European Research Council on the open access issue. Uh, because open access is one of the principal, if not the principal, interest, instrument to achieve open science. Uh, on occasions that I speak, I will give you my personal opinions as well as the opinions of the Scientific Council generally. But it's important to recognize that uh, while the European Research Council is uh, an independent agency, that it doesn't have total independence, particularly in the matter of determining policy, because ultimately it is funded by the European Commission. So therefore we have an obligation to apply uh, Commission policies. And that while uh, we do, uh, uh, while we do support the principle of open access, as I said, we have to comply with Commission policy, but we deviate from it only to the extent that we sometimes push at the frontiers further. That, as I said, the European Research Council was created uh, by the European Commission under Framework 7, so therefore we have been in being uh, for, we're in our seventh year of existence. In practical terms, this means that we have, uh, in making our recommendations, we have to comply with European policy and that when, when we have recommendations over and above European policy that these are by exhortation rather than by mandate. We don't have the authority to require our grantees to comply with any rules other than those determined by the Commission itself. Therefore, while as we say that we see as a fundamental part of our mission the promotion of open access to the published output of research findings, that is the research that we fund, we cannot claim to be more than a moral force in promoting access beyond uh, what the Commission requires. However, we do, as you will see from the slide coming up now, we do go somewhat beyond uh, what the Commission mandates. Uh, first of all, we are recommending, and this is a recommendation, discipline-specific repositories where we think this is advisable and appropriate. And the European Scientific Council remains open to the idea of adding other disciplinary repositories to the European uh, PMC and to uh, archives that we mention in that particular repository. So that we hope to add further discipline-specific repositories as we identify ones which we consider will be helpful to our task. Secondly, we contribute to the cost of the maintenance and development of repositories. We pay a significant grant to Europe PMC and a smaller grant to Archive uh, to maintain their infrastructure in operation. That means that our researchers, when they use those repositories, don't have to pay any further charges because we are already contributing to their costs. We go beyond the normal e e uh, EU brief uh, by covering the cost of an author processing charges where journals require those. Uh, I, think, I hope you're familiar with the concept of an author processing charge. Some journals apply what is called a goal model whereby the author has to, to pay a charge uh, to provide immediate open access. And that where that is imposed, we permit uh, the people to meet that cost out of their grants. And that with the ERC promotes open access further by having a full-time scientific officer dedicated to advising and assisting ERC grantees on, um, with open access issues. It maintains the working group on open access whose responsibility is to keep itself informed on debates that are occurring and uh, to keep the Scientific Council generally up to date with evolving <coughs> policies so that we can have make some input into those policies and above all we want to be in a position to offer the best possible advice to our grantees to meet open access requirements. Now one positive outcome of these investments because these have been significant investments by the ERC in its own grantees have been that throughout the lifetime of Framework 7, ERC grantees have proven themselves more responsive 
to open access exhortations on more recently requirements than have their counterparts in the other pillars of the Framework 7 program. Our calculations show that during the early years of Framework 7, when open access was not mandatory, ERC grantees seem to have deposited about 62% of their publications on open access repositories, and the figure rises to about 70% when we look at life sciences <coughs> alone. The compliance figure rose sharply uh, after 2012 when open access became mandatory under Commission rules, and that we now hope that we're coming close to achieving 100% compliance. Because of the ready willingness with which ERC grantees have embraced open access, researchers throughout the world have enjoyed free access to their research outputs, either through institutional repositories or discipline-specific repositories, or in some instances through both. The ERC ambition for Horizon 2020 is to achieve 100% compliance rate, at least to publications. Thus, the ERC hopes by example to further the ambition of the Commission to achieve by 2020 comprehensive open access to all research publications that enjoy national or Commission funding uh, within the European research area. We further believe that if Europe takes the lead, that this will spur researchers in other parts of the globe to emulate what is being attempted in Europe. That me this means we can at least dream of having universal open access to research publications by 2020. And the ERC further hopes to play its part in making this dream become a reality by maintaining contact uh, with uh, actions outside Europe, uh, advocating and promoting open access policies. Now having explained what the dream is, I should re briefly explain the thinking behind it before identifying some of the difficulties in making the dream a reality. First, in explaining my own personal enthusiasm, enthusiasm for open access, I should say that I have the advantage of age and can remember the long-standing practice when journal editors provided a bundle of off-prints to the authors of each article published by them, which authors then usually sent as a gift to fellow researchers who they believe to have an interest in their subject. This practice may have resulted in some senior researchers being bundled with hundreds of unwanted off-prints off and being expected to send notes of acknowledgement that they had received them and perhaps even had read them. However, on the positive side, the practice indicated that researchers then all adhered to the idea fostered by the European Enlightenment that every advance in knowledge is to the benefit of humanity and should be shared immediately and free of charge, uh, and shared particularly with those best equipped to appreciate the value of the research being done. It is unsurprising, therefore, that researchers of my generation who sent or received off-prints in the past should welcome open access, which involves nothing more than the harnessing of digital technology to broadcast research findings more effectively and more comprehensively and perhaps universally than could ever, could ever have been achieved through the print culture alone. Researchers of my generation also see the benefits of open access because they have lived through the time where researchers have not only been deprived of these off-prints, but many of them have also been deprived of ready access to research publications as publishers have increased subscription rates to journals initially to the point where the individual subscriber uh, frequently cannot meet the cost and soon uh, to the level where many research institutions could no longer meet the subscription charges demanded by publishers. Open access is therefore a means to breach the artificial blockage to knowledge that has been created by this cost factor. Uh, many of the publishers have escalated their subscription rates to levels that bear scant relationship to the costs associated with the production of the journals themselves. Another benefit of open access is that research findings can now find their way into parts of the world where for various reasons researchers did not have access previously. 
To demonstrate this point, I will tax your patience by referring to the experience of my brother, who spent 15 years of his life as a pediatric consultant and a researcher in respiratory medicine at the Hospital of Sick Children in Toronto. He tells me that whenever he published a research paper during his years in Canada, he received an early request by postcard from an enterprising medical librarian in a certain country in Eastern Europe with a request that he should post him with an off-print of his published paper. This librarian apparently communicated in this fashion to all the authors, in particular journals, and then attempted to reassemble full issues of these medical journals to which the library was not able uh, to meet the cost or perhaps were per permitted uh, politically from subscribing to journals in the Western world. My brother, who like myself had been educated in an impoverished Ireland where university libraries could ill afford the cost of international journals, always cooperated readily with these requests. But my story is relevant to our present purpose because it, it provides a practical demonstration both of the desperate sense of deprivation that educated people can experience when they are cut off from current research and also it ex ex explains how easily the thirst for knowledge can today be satisfied by open access which requires on the part of the receiver nothing besides a, a computer and access to the internet. In the light of these narratives which have touched on the impediments to the flow of knowledge that may result, result from economic and political considerations, you may well ask why the European Research Council is willing to support gold as well as green open access models. The simple answer is that our prime concern as a grant giving body is to ensure that the researchers we fund are able to publish their findings in whatever journals they consider best and most appropriate for the papers they write. If we refused to pay the author publication charges required by gold open access journals, we would in effect be either curtailing the choice of publication outlets available to our grantees or be delaying the release of their publications on open access repositories due to the imposition by the publishers of embargo periods. Therefore, all members of the Scientific Council are agreed that we should continue to pay APC charges to ensure that our grantees have free choice of journals in which to publish. This permissive approach does not mean that individual members of the Scientific Council do not have concerns, even moral concerns, over the issue of gold open access and the ERC has never stated a preference for gold over green or indeed never have we issued a public statement on the whole debate of green versus gold. My own personal opinion is that the advocates of gold have always made their case on a national rather than a European wide much less a global wide context and they have been very coy in explaining how and by how much their subscription charges will drop once gold is in place. However, my more fundamental concern is that the strict application of gold uh, with the universal enforcement of APCs will possibly make it possible for early stage or even established researchers in the less affluent countries of Europe and beyond or those attached to less well-funded research institutions to publish their research papers in prestigious journals uh, which have APC charges. At the moment, uh, libr libraries in less affluent countries frequently are not able to afford, afford the subscription costs of journals. But this does not mean that the researchers are not permitted to publish in those journals. You don't have to be a subscriber in a journal to publish in the journal. However, uh, under the gold dispensation, all authors are being called upon to pay an APC once their papers have been approved for publication. And I find it difficult to imagine how a researcher from Romania or Bulgaria or under present circumstances from Greece, Portugal or Ireland could afford charges which range from 750 euros to 3,000 euros per 
published article. In countries like Romania and Bulgaria, the annual salary of an academic would probably be in and about 5,000 euros. So the idea of being able to pay 3,000 to publish one article seems uh, effectively to be excluding them entirely from the possibility of being published. Uh, uh, some of the advocates of gold suggest that there will be exceptional cases provided for, that there will be a charity category, and that nobody will be deprived of the right of publication because of cost alone. I find this as unconvincing as it is patronizing, and even if such a category were to be established, it would be proved demeaning in practice, as the authors would have to prove their poverty before they would be exempt from the charge. Another consideration is that the gold model strikes me as ill-suited to researchers in humanities uh, disciplines and in some social science disciplines, but I shan't dwell upon that. I believe that European policymakers who are setting the pace to achieve open access compliance by 2020 are unlikely to make significant progress towards meeting their target until the gold versus green issue has been addressed at a pan-European level or even in a global context. This, in my opinion, would in turn require a free and frank discussion of the relationship between the price of journal subscriptions and the cost association with journal production, both in print and online. Having taken the liberty to offer some personal opinion on the difficulties associated with gold open access, I will return to another issue on which the European Research Council differs from the Commission norm. That is in expressing a preference for discipline-specific repositories over institutional repositories. This preference can be explained in the first instance historically, in that the life science members of the Scientific Council were familiar with Europe PMC or its American parent uh, 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 and had begun to recommend its use to ERC grantees in the life sciences well before open access compliance was made mandatory by the European Commission in 2012. At the same time, Scientific Council members with an expertise in engineering and physical sciences were also familiar with archive and had begun to recommend its use to grantees in these areas, even though archive is a preprint service rather than a repository in the strict sense of the term. In more recent years, institutional repositories have been established in many European countries and universities, and the greater number of these are now compliant with the standards laid down by OpenAir, an infrastructure funded to date by recurrent grants from the European Commission which fosters both common standards and interoperability between repositories across Europe and beyond. And open air, as you know, has a close association with this university. This infrastructural development has been recognized by the ERC as a major achievement, without which people would have been unable to dream of open access compliance through the European research area. As a consequence of this development, the ERC expects that institutional repositories will become the first point of deposit for ERC grantees, even if the ERC still recommends to some of its grantees that they subsequently migrate their material to and make it available from discipline-specific repositories. This preference is explained by the excellence, if expensive, service that Europe PMC provides to researchers by hosting only high-quality publications by providing easy search facilities and by becoming the first point of reference for any researchers wishing to be brought up to date with current research in the life sciences domain. Because of its exemplary nature, Europe PMC addresses the second major problem that confronts all researchers in all domains of the 21st century. That is the rapid increase in the number of research publications and the difficulty that proliferation presents to every researcher who wishes to assimilate and to appraise new knowledge. This problem has, if anything, been made more acute, at least in Europe, by open access. Because with the establishment of institutional repositories, the heads of institutions, which bear the cost of maintaining the repositories, 
are exerting pressure on members of academic staff to have all their publications or research outputs, sometimes regardless of quality and sometimes whether published or unpublished, available on the institutional open access repository. Heads of institutions have all the more reason to exert such pressure when they are concerned to enhance the prospect of their institutions creeping ever higher in international university ranking tables where it seems that quantity rather than quality of publications is the measure which is being applied. Therefore, as we sur survey open access developments from the vantage point of the ERC, we see the lodgement of research output in an institutional repository as but a step towards gaining access to more discerning repositories where publications are more likely to come to the early attention of the lead researchers in the relevant discipline. This brief conspectus will convey some understanding of where the ERC stands in relation to open access policy and of the reasoning behind the decisions we have taken. We differ in our emphasis from general European Commission policy because we are primarily concerned that our grantees published in the best possible places for them and that their publications come to the early attention of leading researchers in their respective fields. We are also concerned that research students and even undergraduates should have easy access to the published work of our grantees although we give less attention to the frequently expressed political desire that research publications have been funded by the European taxpayer and should be available to these same taxpayers. The ERC is and has been active in promoting open access. It an, has in several respects been exemplary in promoting the cause and it is confident of achieving close to 100% compliance for its researchers. We realize, however, that our grantees are a privileged group backed by an agency which is prepared to meet gold charges where these are required and has staff at hand to address any open access difficulties that researchers may encounter, whether the difficulties come from publishers or from dealing with repositories. When we look at the broader picture, the anticipated progress does not appear to be as so smooth or so certain. And I wish to conclude by making a few recommendations on steps that might be made to hasten the process. I would suggest that officers of the Commission, and I think the Commission is the best place, should convene a meeting between representatives of publishers and other parties who have an interest in open access to discuss a, how the price of journals might be reduced at a pan-European level rather than an individual country level. I say that because there have been negotiations in place between some commercial publishers in recent years with particular governments about setting a particular price for a particular country and then committing the party to these negotiations to silence so that no two countries know what is being charged in the other. So I think that it is only the Commission that can overcome this obstacle by having a pan-European debate on costs. It really is the responsibility of all and I think that is the only way uh, to have such a, a, a proper conversation. And I think in that conversation also we should address the green versus gold debate on open access, again addressing it in a pan-European context what is a realistic charge to make if you're going to impose the charge right across Europe rather than agreeing on a price which might be appropriate in Germany or in the United Kingdom and then attempting to impose it on everybody else. The second issue to be resolved, this time in consultation with university heads, is the extent to which university institutions are ready to provide recognition for career purposes, to research findings published in online only publications. I can see that the logic of open access is that the print version of publications will disappear in a relatively short period of time. But as long as the university institutions are only willing to recognize print publications as the measure for appointment in the first instance and for promotion thereafter, then you're going to have this artificial blockage 
towards the development towards online publications only, which I see is the logical outcome of open access. But there again has to be a, a, a conversation at a university level between universities on making this development possible. If we want to make progress with open access for journal publications, and I think that is where the conversation should take place, I would suggest concentrating on that alone until a satisfactory conclusion has been reached. And that to some degree the debate is moving away from there in recent times because the debate is now moving to research data and to some degree on having open access to monograph publications. I think if we focused on the journal issue for perhaps two years and arrive at a satisfactory conclusion on that, then we could lo look at the data issue uh, thereafter. We must avoid the one-size-fits-all trap and to allow for conclusions taking account of discipline-specific requirements. That again is another reason why I think we need to move towards uh, discipline-specific repositories and address the question of the degree to which copyright and intellectual property issues obtain in dis different disciplines. Uh, that we need to work closely, and I think this is particularly for open air, to discuss closely with other countries and continents to ensure that when common standards are agreed with in Europe, that these same, same standards are going to be applied in other parts of the globe. And then, as my final point, I do think we need to have more discipline-specific repositories. And when we have all of these requirements, I think we need to arrive at the point when we reach an understanding of the true costs of open access because the cost of creating repositories and maintaining repositories is a cost as well. That is not a cost that anybody has particularly addressed up to this point, at least in the European level, because the Commission up to this point has been covering the cost of open air together with universities uh, university libraries who have maintained staff members to maintain particular repositories. But when the Commission stops funding open air, when we have new discipline specific repositories, who is going to meet this charge? This is all part of the cost. So I contribute these as my contributions to debate and discussion. And thank, thank you, you very much. much.